Okay. All right, here we go. Marty. unmistakable sounds of They Might Be Giants. Uh, John Linnell and John Flansberg, thanks so much for joining us on RN Drive and welcome back to Australia. Jules, it thank great you to for be having here. us. It's great to have you. And of course, that song, Dr. Worm, is uh, in a way, it's like your Australian calling card. I gather it took off in Australia unlike any other, is that right? Well, you know, uh, we, we uh, were on a record label that imploded as the uh, song came out. <laughs> so um, it was, it really made no splash at all in the United States. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is uh, analogous to the end of Spinal Tap where, you know, they say sex farms a hit in Japan. Like, <laughs> it, it means a lot more here than anywhere else. I mean, we've always done it in the show. And yeah. I think, like, among the front row, I mean, the people who, who really track what we do carefully, it's a beloved song. It's a, yeah. it's a quality song. But uh, it, it really... I'm still surprised that anybody knows it here. Oh, well, if you're still surprised, perhaps I shouldn't ask you the question because I know this is your fifth time yes. uh, in Australia. Um, are you able to proffer an expert opinion on what it is about that song which resonates so uniquely with Australia? I think the answer to that question is no. <laughs> we, 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 we don't have... Right. We don't know. Fair enough, too. It's probably a good thing. All right, look, um, uh, They Might Be Giants uh, turned 30 recently, I gather. Congratulations. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a long time being almost or allegedly giants. Uh, how did it all start? Well, it all began... Well, John and I went to school together. We were actually, when we were kids, we, uh, uh, John's family moved to this suburban town of, outside of Boston um, where I grew up. And uh, he's a year older than me, and we ended up being friends in high school. And uh, then the whole, uh, you know, new wave scare of 1977 happened, and uh, we decided uh, to uh, get we, into the punk rock music. We decided we wanted in. We and wanted we, to be and we, 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 we moved to New York and, and found out that... 
it was it was all over. We, we, yeah. There was still some dust we, we, settling. We joined the punk people in 1981 in yeah. New York City, and they had all moved along. To, yeah, right. Well, yeah, they were probably just, reg- just starting right. in Australia. You should have come then. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, was it always going to be a duo, or were there other Johns that you considered involving in the well, band? Well, it, it was originally a duo. The first ten years, we we were just we were just a duo, and then we in a radical shift we decided to get a band uh, uh in the early 90s right. so you know, there's, was... there's like a complicated truth to like everything like why we had the format that we had when we started like mm. we were living in apartments so it was kind of unreasonable to we couldn't really afford rehearsal spaces um drummers as our drummer Marty Bella will tell you are are, are precious commodities in new york city <laughs> and basically every, every drummer that lives in new york city means that another band can live you know that can start um or maybe more uh so we couldn't really afford to pay anybody and and we didn't have any prospects i mean we really it took us a very long time to just be a local establish ourselves as a local band Mm. so uh it was pathetic (laughs) Uh, look uh, over those 30 years how would you characterize uh, your relationship is it kind of brothers teammates nagging husband and wife how does it work? Um, I think I think you're somewhere in the realm there with those various <laughs> descriptions. I mean, we we um, I would say uh, we've remained friends somehow through all of this, and that maybe is the key to why we're still doing this: is that we um, we never um, got completely fed up with each other. I, th- I think we I think we figured out at some point that we both contributed essential things to this project and that you know it was a greater than the sum of its parts type of situation i completely disagree <laughs> and, i was uh, looking at that he's saying he's yes. on it again he's talking again yeah. <laughs> right yes i think it's 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 in some ways it's like the brother thing without the the part without like the oasis part of <laughs> right the brother yeah. thing. well you have a you terrible know? relationship with your actual brother so that, <laughs> that's that's uh that's why that uh well, Metaphor doesn't work. That's right. Us. Well, before yeah. we descend into the uh, psychiatrist couch too much further, um, can you tell us about Dial a Song? I mean, that's obviously a kind of uh, iconic part of your um, your sure. history. Yes. Um, well, we started Dial a Song when the phone machine fad was uh, 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 happening in New York City. It was it, phone machines came to New York City before they were anywhere else. I'm sure they came to you know Sydney or Melbourne Just somewhere. Recently, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so. It seemed like a way to get our music out to people who weren't going to nightclubs. We were playing in all these very sort of demi monde, Lower East Side, East Village places in the middle of the night. And it was very cool. Uh, and we felt very cool to be playing in all these very cool places. But it seemed very isolated from the rest of New York City uh, and, and regular people. And we just wanted to figure out a way for people to hear about the band that didn't require them going to a discotheque at one in the morning. Uh, you know, I mean, there's what we're doing is not for everybody, and I think we're very aware of that. And the the only professional outlet being discotheques in the middle of the night seemed ve- so fashion oriented and so antithetical to a certain aspect of what we're doing. I mean, it it actually speaks volumes that any scene could accommodate a band like They Might Be Giants and still be considered trendy. I mean, <laughs> what a trendy time it must have been. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but so so people could ring up and they could listen to the songs on the on yes, the, exactly. the voice the answering machine. Yes, and it was just a song. You you didn't hear an announcement or anything. It was it was this very sort of anonymous thing. And it got quite large, didn't it? Yeah, it became a phenomenon. A lot of college students would call, and a lot of people would call from work. And uh, it was, in a way, it wasn't really. I don't even. It's hard to say it was so much about the music as it was just about this kind of weird experience of using your phone for something besides just making a, te- a regular telephone call. I, mean, I think it is, had something to do with the the fact that people felt like they had an intimate relationship directly with the band as opposed to when you buy their record or go see them that they were kind of weirdly linked in and that it seemed like an inside thing it was an insidery thing to to know this phone number and call it up you know weirdly i mean i don't know why it should be more intimate than other ways Mm. than than actually going to see a band in person but it, it, it apparently was on RN Drive, we're speaking with They Might Be Giants, uh, John Linnell and John Flansberg. Uh, guys, uh, I suppose the whole dial a song thing uh, it shows that from very early on you were thinking about the, the relationships between music, technology and distribution um, uh, and niches and, and the mainstream. That's obviously changed radically during the course of your career. Uh, what are your thoughts on the kind of upsides and downsides of the way music's distributed these I days. think we're 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 about as grumpy as any band about <laughs> the possibility of losing insane amounts of revenue because people don't feel like they need to 
Next question, please. Send money to <laughs> That's bands right. Okay. Anymore, Do I have to pay for the next question, or can I just get it for free? We would prefer right. it if you <laughs> pay for the well, next question. You know, I mean, it, it's it's impacted on on it's you know everybody who's a musician now is feeling this weird new reality, which is it's much much harder to make a living uh, making records now. Uh, but in a way, I suppose you know we we were we were pretty upbeat about the whole not making any money thing in the first place. <laughs> right. You know, right. Like yeah. yeah. We, Triumph of low expectations. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, I mean, it strikes me though that you're not kind of technophobic i mean you kind of no, the, the nanobots was released uh, on soundcloud before it came out physically i think you know the, the the for i think we're like regular people you know i think uh people are have grown accustomed to all this technological change and some of it's really interesting and fun and we're just trying to find out what you can make out of it you know with the phone machine it just seemed like an interesting way to get our stuff to people we just did this iphone app that's that's totally free and uh it's just in a fun kind of strange way to experience new songs and that's that seems just a better way to approach technology rather than wait for it to come to you or be prepackaged somehow well of course the tax minimizing masses of the radio national audience haven't paid a cent uh, to listen to us now and i suppose there might be some people out there who might even have phones or something that they can record more of your music on would you be willing to play another song absolutely yes, yes for yeah, free get, yes, wow yes. Get those, those, those audio hijack things <laughs> rolling what are we going to hear uh well uh here's a song off our brand new album it's called tesla tesla Brought the X-ray photo to the world Ushered the neon light into the world Here is a mind that can see across space Here is a mind soaring free Sound turns to light and light turns to waves And the waves turn to all things perceived Maybe drive one insane how can that knowledge be tamed Tesla brought the radio waves into the world ushered the neon light into the world the hotel New Yorker he's dead on the floor the body of Nikolai to the world ushered the remote control into the world he brought the bladeless turbine into the world ushered the neon light into the Tesla from They Might Be Giants. Julian Morrow with you on RN Drive. Uh, gentlemen, the new album is called uh, Nanobots. Yes, correct. Um, are you pro Nanobot or anti? We, um, we, in some ways, I think the the it's a little misleading because the title of the album is is it's named after one of the songs on the <laughs> album. The song on the album is not specifically about nanobots. It just, <laughs> it's just kind of an open ended metaphor, I, I would say. Um, it's it's. I mean, if it's if it's about anything, it's about having unruly children of any kind. <laughs> so that's relatable, no question there. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, what about another song's called Black Ops? Uh, have you had an official reaction from the CIA to the song? Uh, well, we're on a watch list now. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Yes. Yeah, but that's the, that's it. We right. just we're just aware that you know we hear some clicks when we pick up the phone. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. Uh, one of the noticeable things, and this is not just on this album, but uh, throughout your career, is that often you have very beautifully formed and quite brief songs. Do you do you have a, a, a th an overarching theory of how long a song should be, or is we, it a case by case thing? Well, I think we 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 love the three minute pop song with all our hearts, but we also do feel like there's something really weirdly compelling about a song that begins and ends as soon as it's said what it has to say. 
And there's, you know, I mean, it seems like, I, I don't know why other bands don't do 20 second songs. It's such an incredibly appealing format, <laughs> I think. Have you ever heard kind of, you know, 40 minute extended dance mixes of your stuff? Um, yeah, we, there <laughs> have been be some, some remixes and they're, <laughs> they're interesting to hear. But, you know... Uh, 40 minute dance remixes of the 20 second songs. <laughs> that would be, that yeah, that would be, be that super would be, yeah. exciting. That's right. I don't know, I, I guess uh, Flaming Lips just did like, a, they did a song mm. that was... How, some that, impossible length long. Yeah, very short. I can't remember the exact And you got song. it in a thumb drive and a gummy bear <laughs> skull head. That was how it was they sold. They do marketing. They, yeah. They yes. can market. See, those guys know branding. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the other thing that shines through all, all, all your work is uh, the intelligence and, and the wit, even when you're just being uh, silly. Do, do you think your creative process is more kind of intellectual than other musicians? Oh no, no! I, I think it's pretty, pretty intuitive, and 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 pretty much of. There's a very gut relationship yep. that we have to, to not just the words, but also the sounds. You know, it's 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 about hearing something and deciding you like it, and and in a way, not describing, not explaining it to ourselves. I think that's a very fundamental thing about what we do is that we don't have some theory behind it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we you know, it would be a really different project if we had. <laughs> I mean, we, we so there's no calculus. thesis forthcoming or anything like that. No, no, no. I mean, we craft our songs, you know, pretty carefully, and we really love like arranging and and producing stuff. But uh, I, you know, our our uh, producer engineer Pat Dillard also works with David Byrne, yeah. and um, because of that, it, uh, a lot of David Byrne's like personal stuff is just kicking around the studio that we're working in, like. The, you know the little that's cool like yeah. uh, you know the little guitar pedals that he recorded psycho killer with are just like <laughs> there and uh, I had the strange occasion of picking up one of his songwriting notebooks just thinking it was a you know just a pad of paper wow. kind of thing and um, that guy's super smart <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was it was like uh, a, like a flow chart of a very very uh, basically like the the history of the universe um, then kind of winnowing down to a song lyric that just seemed to be about a relationship. And it was the most, it was, was the most, it was totally graphic and very, very, uh, it's almost impossible to describe, but I mean, that evidently is his process. Like he kind of, he has, he's got a very... And you didn't have the same thing for Dr. Worm? No, no, no exactly. No. <laughs> Not exactly. Well, uh, but I mean, a lot of people uh, would use various words to describe the role of humor in your um your, your music right right how do you think of well i think it's another aspect of the fact that we don't we don't edit ourselves yep. that much we we if we like something we we go in that direction and and uh we're we try not to be too inhibited about stuff like humor i think that there's something very appealing about just going with something that makes you smile and Trying not to worry about acting cool, I think, is an important thing in what we do. Yeah, you it's know, sort of... As it, you can probably tell that. I yeah. That we're not I mean, it's... it's What's <laughs> odd about it... Is, <laughs> what's odd about it, I think, is that from a... There's so few bands that incorporate humor in what they're doing, you would think that it would be the point of what we're doing. Mm. But I think, in fact, like, if we actually wanted to be, you know, popular for being funny, we would invest a lot more in actually... Making the songs, there would be funny. there would be jokes. They, they yeah. should be, yeah, yeah. They which, should be which funnier. Yeah, yeah, right. you know <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, I don't know. I've have said this in the past, but I, I feel like it's the best illustration of of the the reality of of rock music is rock rock music is kind of like soap operas. Like there's never any humor in soap operas. Soap operas are so much like real life in so many ways, like the melodrama and mm. the relationships and all the everything but it's this the, this humor free zone like it's somehow not allowed or it doesn't exist it's on a that level plane. of self-awareness right I yeah so end. we're more like primetime tv where, <laughs> yeah. where there is there's yeah. actually some we're like basic cable yeah right. fantastic okay well it's yeah. a pretty good ba basic package yeah. i like it yeah. um, um uh, i'd like to speak briefly about uh, the kids music that, that sure. you've written um one of the things i find uh well i suppose it is ironic is that a lot of your grown-up music uh, has a real appealing simplicity to it and i um was quite sure Shocked to find out how much I learnt from listening to your kids' songs. There's a lot of a lot, lot of right. data in there. Right? A lot of that information is is not uh, factual. You should just be you should be aware that some of it is not. But I enjoy true. the correction songs as well. <laughs> right. About yes. the, was that about the sun? I think was. not Yes. It? Yeah. Yes. We wrote, we wrote a follow up song. Well, there's a there's a song that we covered for years and years, which was written uh, in the I think in the in the. 60s uh, about the the about the sun and it was based on then current information 
there was a lot more science between then and now, which 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 demonstrated, for one thing, that the sun is not a mass of incandescent gas, which was the title of the song. So so we came up with a song that that just incorporated current information. Unfortunately, our correction song also provides a lot of completely <laughs> reckless. It's a, it's uh, a poetic song. Kind of poetic, right, right, I say. poetic <laughs> information that that is in, in no way factual. So so it's a correction that actually makes matters worse. <laughs> Uh, how did the move uh, in, into into a kids' album come about? Was it just that you, you had families and wanted to entertain them, or no? We actually didn't. Uh, John's son hadn't even been born when we started working on the first kids project. It was really the same way you would approach doing a Christmas album. Um, you know, it just seemed like an interesting one-off that it would be like, oh, we'll do a we'll do a kids' album, and it's. I think we've always been attracted to the best stuff in the world of kids stuff. You know, whether it's like you know, the Phantom Tollbooth or Bugs Bunny or uh, it's just a, there's just worlds of Dr. Head, you know, Dr. Yeah. Seuss. I mean, yeah. there's, the, you know, the good kid stuff is just ama- amazing creative work. It's somehow really free of a lot of other uh, concerns. And, and it just seemed like an opportunity to write in a way that, you know, uh, would be an int- or just a great challenge and to be part of that world and to be in kids' lives that way. It seemed, seemed like kind of flattering. Um, and the thing came out, and it was very successful on almost on virtually every level. Like it sold, you know, more copies than than anything we'd done in recent memory, and and it just was a big smash. And so we got approached by Disney to do a bunch of DVDs and CDs, and that was sort of when the educational veneer came into play. I think we would have been happy to make more psychedelic records for yeah. kids, but uh, but. <laughs> Vitamin All of a sudden, the fact check is a coming. Yeah, <laughs> vitamin enriched uh, enter- infotainment for children is, seems like it's a, it's a necessity. It's a growth industry. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, music for kids is a very crowded and, and lucrative uh, space when you move. Yeah, but they it. stink. Yeah, yeah. Did you get death threats from the Wiggles or anything, though? Like, is it- we, we don't really know anything about the, the kids. Think, I think that also might give us a competitive edge yeah. is that um, all, you know, all the anecdotal information we've been, we've been supplied leads us to believe that uh, it is a, a dismal, dismal <laughs> place. So um, we just kind of tiptoe, you know, we were just walking backwards to the door away from the kids' scene. <laughs> well, and, and I suppose that's good news for uh, uh, adult fans of They Might Be Giants. You're touring uh, around Australia and you've got a very packed schedule. Uh, yes. At the moment, it's 100 yeah. shows before Christmas or something? 100 shows, yes. Is that usual for you guys or have you kind no, of, this is some is sort of penance that you're an, serving out? This year is an unusually uh, uh, big tour. I mean, this Australian tour is off the graph. We've, we've, as you know, we played here four times before, but I don't think we've ever done more than 10 days at a time in Australia and this is this is an entire month of shows so it's it's really exciting because it's the result of some kind of crazy explosion of interest. Maybe because we haven't been here in a while, yeah. um, people are, are uh, wanting to buy tickets to see us. So that's really exciting and, and great. And, uh, you know, we'll be talking different by the time we get home, <laughs> yeah. I think. We're doing this Groove in the Move Festival, which is also just sounds like a fascinating, yeah. different kind of show because we're out in all these rural areas. And I can't, I can't tell if it's a destination festival that people travel to, or if we're going to be playing for like people wearing overalls for and cows. holding yeah. shotguns. Every day will be an adventure, I'm uh-huh. sure. <laughs> well, look, it's been a great pleasure uh, speaking with you, John and John from They Might Be Giants. Thanks so much for joining us on Friday Drive. And uh, given that it's your thing, would you take us out with a song? Certainly. Absolutely. Um, this is a song off our brand new album. It's called Lost My Mind. Lost my mind Left somewhere behind Must have put it in Amongst the things for throwing out Nowhere to be found Buried underground Go try to dig it up But I don't want to waste my time To summarize This whole planet is Try to dig it up, but I 
I don't want to waste my time Floating down a lazy river is my mind Circling in on none baggage carousel is all so my mind Do you ever even think of me The way I'm always thinking of you With the glassy eyes stare Knowing somewhere out there It walks the earth Separated at birth Terrorizing citizens With intelligent remarks Lost my mind, left somewhere behind Go try to dig it up, but I don't know where Because I lost my mind